we are delighted and incredibly fortunate to have with us a superstar of the alumni relations world. She is by profession the executive director of alumni relations at the University of Pennsylvania. Give her a big, massive, huge GLS welcome to Elise Betts. We're going to start this afternoon with a brief exercise. Sit back, relax, take a deep breath, and imagine you are 18 years old and about to start college at Harvard University. You have been dreaming of this since you were a little kid and learned how to surf the web. And your decision was cemented when you saw the social network. As you walk through Johnston Gate, you think about touching the John Harvard statue. It's truly a dream come true. You got chills as you walked across the yard, gazing up and thinking about the unparalleled history of this place. You are feeling pretty special. You have just moved into your room in Harvard Yard with all of the other freshmen and met the person who will be your best friend for life, although you certainly don't know that yet. Your family just drove away. You feel a bit overwhelmed and slightly scared as you make your way across campus. You really hope you make some friends. Everyone is so smart here. You're excited to start your adult life and enjoy as much toffee bar pie frozen yogurt as you can eat at Annenberg Hall. You walk across campus in the warm August air with your new roommate to the Sanders Theater where you first sat as a high school sophomore listening to Dean of Admissions Bill Fitzsimmons talk about this magical place. New student orientation is about to begin with a program called Harvard Traditions. You're going to learn all about the storied history and legendary traditions of this place that you now call home. You sit down, surrounded by your new classmates. It's about to begin. <laughs> Another turning point, a fork stuck in the road. Time grabs you by the wrist, directs you where to go. So make the best of Welcome to the class of 2021, the newest members of our Harvard community. My name is Elise Betts, and I am the founder of the Harvard Traditions Program. This program is designed to build our community teach you all about the history and revered traditions of this amazing school and keep you connected to Harvard, to one another, and our alumni all over the world for your lifetime. I want to do a little guided imagery with you. The year is 2071. The date is June 16th, and we are standing in the class of 2021 atrium of the new multimedia entertainment complex on Radcliffe Yard. We are celebrating the class of 2021's 50th reunion. We're dedicating this new building, your 50th reunion gift to Harvard, in honor of recently retired President Drew Faust, who retired at the age of 103. You are surrounded by your partners, spouses, some of whom you met this week during NSO, children, grandchildren, and 1,500 members of your class as you listen to new Harvard president, Malia Obama. Thank you for being the most loyal, engaged, and connected class that Harvard has ever produced. After the dedication, we will make our way to the Harvard Stadium. 
And here, we're going to recreate the class of 2021 photo that you took 50 years ago. After the photo, you will participate in an encore of the hallowed primal scream, <laughs> followed by a walk over to the Hong Kong for a scorpion bowl. You see, you're never too old for Harvard traditions. This might seem like a far-fetched fantasy, but in 50 years, I want you to remember this moment. You are now a lifelong member of the Harvard family that has thousands of members all over the world. And your membership will span your entire life. And your experience starts here. OK, so what I just did with you is what I do with our freshman class on the very first day of new student orientation every year. Our program is called Highball to Heyday, the Penn Experience. And this is actually a picture of me last year and this year doing my annual selfie with the incoming class with our Penn Tradition student leaders. So what am I doing here? I am influencing the culture while our students are blank slates, taking it all in and forming their opinions about our school. First, I want to thank Graduate, our newest leader, Chris Marshall, who I have been very fortunate to know for many years, and I'm thrilled. You guys did a good job grabbing him. And Daniel, and Michael, and Robert, and everybody who's involved in the uh, logistics of this conference. As professionals in this field, we know how much goes into putting something like this together. I'm really excited to be here. I've done this a few times, and I, every time I kind of ramp up my presentation. What'd you think of that opening? Yeah. Pretty cool? Seriously, imagine when you were 18 and sitting in a room like this with people you, you know, barely know, you maybe have met minutes before, and hearing something like that. You know, imagine what that does to a young person. Um, so I'm going to share some examples from the Penn program that is called Penn Traditions Building Our Community. It is now 14 years old, which means I'm getting older, but it is, uh, I think, the oldest, uh, most comprehensive advancement program for students in the country. And it's been modeled by many of you. I just happen to be in the right place at the right time, and I'll tell you that story in a minute. So how many alumni relations professionals do we have in the room? OK. How many frontline fundraisers exclusively? Just a few. How many have both responsibilities? How about career services? How about services in general? Anybody I'm missing? Okay, everybody in this room, regardless of what your position is or what work you're doing on the ground at your institution, needs to be involved in a program of this kind for it to be successful. Um, I have a little bit of something for all of you. I'm going to share a strategy that will make your job simpler, more fun, and more satisfying. Okay, I can say uh, that maybe other than our president, uh, I have the best job on campus because I literally interact with our students, with our alumni, with faculty, with staff, uh, with parents, all constituents, with prospective students. I interact with all of them, and most of it is through this program. So let me give you a little context. The University of Pennsylvania is in uh, Philadelphia. It is an Ivy League school. And in the 70s through the early 90s, it was a good regional school for white men in the Northeastern United States. It was a 50% acceptance race. Great. And in 1995, we started to rise in the rankings. We became more diverse. Um, our faculty were more accomplished. Um, and there was a real disconnect between the student satisfaction and engagement and participation. And that was evident most, in, from my perspective, in our, what we called our senior gift drive. So in 2002, I was given the senior gift drive to take over. And I had a group of student leaders who came to me and said, like, can we shake things up a little bit? I noticed that we're really not doing a whole lot with our senior gift drive. We were treating them like they were in the 50th reunion. We were mailing them letters to some mail folders that they never checked. It was very prescribed. And I said, well, what do you have in mind? So they came to me with this sign, OK, that sign you see on the top. And you'll notice that they were comparing the University of Pennsylvania to Harvard and Princeton and their giving rates. And we were at about 18% that year. So we put that sign in the center of campus. And I was in my job about two years at the time. I'm in my little office at the Penn Fund. I was a frontline fundraiser at the time. And my boss comes down and says, President Judith Roden's on the phone. She wants to talk to you. So I started packing my stuff. 
I'm like, okay, I'm so out of here. I go down to his office, and she's on speakerphone. And, um, she says, I have a couple questions for you. Is that accurate? Are those numbers that you have on that sign accurate? And I said, yes, Dr. Roden, we did the benchmarking. You know, Harvard and Princeton have a much higher participation rate. She said, how can that be? I've spent a lot of time. She, she was at Harvard. She had spent time at Princeton. She said, this doesn't seem right. Students are much happier here. And I said, well, you know, we're really not doing anything with them. We wait until the second semester of their senior year to start soliciting them. There's no education. It's very prescribed. And she's like, all right, you know, I get this. And she says, well, listen, get that sign off my campus. This was April, and our prospective students who had been admitted were coming onto campus, and she did not want families to see this because we were going after the same students who were also being admitted to these schools. And she said, you can put it back on after pen preview days are over, and then I want a proposal on my desk. What are we going to do about this? So the Pen Traditions program was born. So I spent some time working on um, what became the Pen Traditions program with the work group around campus. I'll talk a little bit more about that. First, I want to show you this. What's the number one reason alumni stay connected and give back to their alma mater? A positive student experience. And we can influence this with the program that I'm describing. We can influence this. You think about it. Your alumni leaders, who are probably most um, positive and most impactful, probably had good experiences at your institutions. So how are we going to do this? Let's pretend we're starting with a clean slate. Step one is to build a foundation, and we have to think about culture. Everybody in their remarks over the last couple days have, have talked about culture. It's so important to the work we do. And again, culture eats strategy for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and midnight snack. So culture is so important. So everything that I talk about works at my culture, but I want to think about how you might change that or uh, mold it for your own culture. But it's really fundamental. What we need to do is start early. We have students on our campus for three, four, five years, maybe one year, and they're a captive audience. So how are we going to influence this culture? As I said, start early. You need an ally at the top level. So um, for those of you who are vice presidents or executive directors in this room, um, you can be that ally. For those of you who um, are not a vice president or executive director. Think about who you're going to get who's going to say, this is important to our institution. We're going to do this. You can't do this alone. That's another thing I want to talk about. It has to be a true campus-wide collaboration. Think about how you can brand existing programs. And it has to be a priority. Um, I talk a lot about being intentional, deliberate, and explicit. When I went to Dr. Roden with the first proposal back in 2002, 2003, she said, well, wait a minute, are you telling me that you're going to ask students for money at new student orientation? And I was really surprised that that was coming out of her mouth because I thought, we're not going to ask them for money, but we're going to talk about the fact that we will ask them for their support financially with time and with talent. Don't be afraid. We do it very unapologetically. It has to be part of the fabric of the institution. And think about relationships. Everything we do is based on relationships. So we got a working group together across campus to come up with core messages. And this is what we came up with. And this is people from the president's office, the provost's office. We had somebody from our student affairs division. And we came up with these nine core messages. So I want you to think about replacing Penn with the name of your institution. You're welcome. So does this resonate? I mean, there may be some adjustments, but I've done this presentation all over the world, and most institutions say that a lot of this resonates. There might be some language that you might want to add if you're a faith-based institution or a military institution, but for the most part, and I'll make sure, so you guys don't have to take pictures, I give this whole slide presentation to graduate, and I'll make sure you have it. But we spent a lot of time on this, and then we had to think about how are we going to use these messages? How are we going to deliver them to 18-year-olds who are coming at this point from, we have about 85 countries represented on our campus. So we became very creative. So I'm going to show you a, a bunch of pictures to give you a good sense of what this looks like in action. And I just want to remind you uh, that everything can be scaled. So pick a few things to focus on and uh, you know, recognize what your resources are and what your capabilities are. So first, we start with prospective students. 
we have what we call the Penn Alumni Interview Program. 94% of our applicants had an interview with an alumnus last year, and this is Penn's largest volunteer activity. So this is just a screenshot of the web page for the interview program. We have 16,000, almost 17,000 interviewers, and almost half are recent grads. And this has been a game changer for us. And you know what, what, what precipitated that? We opened up Skype, telephone, Google Chat. We were requiring face-to-face -face interviews. That's impossible when you have 400 applicants in China, 500 applicants from India. Our young alumni are getting to people in Africa, in basically every continent, via Skype and other digital technologies. The next thing we do after our students are admitted is we have a group of our Penn Tradition students, it's one of our volunteer arms, uh, called the Admissions Ambassadors. They host admitted students. It is um, a true collaboration between the Advancement Office and Admissions. And now our students have had two significant touch points with our office. They've had an interview and they're being hosted or coming to some program that has the Penn Traditions Alumni Relations logo on it. So they now know, at the very least, what alumni means, because they are students who are coming from other countries who are not entirely sure what that means or what it means to be an alumni. And they've also met some of our Penn Tradition student leaders. So what do we do next? So we've interviewed them. They've come onto campus as prospective students. They yield. They're coming to campus. Then we get into new student orientation. Okay, so this is what we used to do at New Student Orientation. I want you guys to tell me if this looks familiar. You know, we used to table. I got really cool water bottles at my table, and we came up with this idea. We were going to give them laundry bags. We had the coolest table. There were dozens of students stopping by, right? Tabling. That's what we used to do. Okay, this is what we do now. This was just two weeks ago, and I am actually standing up on that cherry picker. We now have to take pictures with a drone because the class is too large. Or the people who come out, the class has always been the same size, but now we get such a large number of incoming students participating in this. And basically, let me tell you what this is. This is a collaboration with athletics, development alumni relations, the Penn Traditions program, and dining. This is the only place first year students can get a meal. So they come down to the athletics complex, and we give them a t-shirt. Um, where's this year's? Oh, I, I don't have this year's, but it just has the Penn logo on the front, and then they all have the Penn Traditions logo with their class here on the back. OK, the only thing we pay for for this giant event where we have the whole class together, the band's there, we sing songs, the only thing we pay for is half of this t-shirt. Athletics wanted to drive people to their facilities, because believe it or not, Penn students don't go to football games anymore. It's such a sad thing. I'm an ex-professional women's football player. I was a quarterback for the Philadelphia Liberty Bell, so football's dear and near to my heart. Uh, but this t-shirt is what they're wearing. So you can see this year it was a blue t-shirt. They're wearing the t-shirt. Uh, we feed them. We play some music. We line them up. We take a picture. That is now the, um, well, I guess not everybody's using Facebook. For, but for those who are, a lot of them have that picture on Facebook. Um, so that is one of the first things we do. I opened my um, guided imagery exercise with um, that, I, I opened my session with the guided imagery exercise that I do with the incoming students. And that is at an event called Highball to Heyday, the Penn Experience. And this is kind of what it looks like. That's the band that you'll see. Uh, they come to teach the songs. So we teach the songs, the history, and the traditions. This is led by student leaders. We follow it with a carnival, and that's why we have that giant ball. Um, I don't recommend you getting one of those balls. It's very hard to, um, it's easy to inflate because I inflate it with my leaf blower, but it's really hard to deflate. It takes like four hours to deflate it. So the event's over and I'm still standing there laying on the ball trying to get the air out. Um, 
but we have representatives from other departments who come to this event, Highball to Hay Day. Our students have a chance to write a thank you note to alumni with the Penn Fund, so it's very representative of the university. Here's some shots of the presentation. Um, you'll see we have some student leaders. We talk about diversity at Penn. Um, we learn the songs from the band. Then we do our banner signing. And again, if you're looking for high impact, low cost, this banner costs about 50 bucks. It's a Tyvek banner. We put Sharpies out and we bring it to all of the new student orientation events. And this is what it looks like at the end of four years. This is our president, Dr. Gutman, with some seniors last year. She signs it every year. She makes sure she signs it. And I take a picture so she can remember where she signs it. This is a full list of what our um, new student orientation events look like. We give out playing cards. And I brought copies of things. I'm going to have you take this when I leave. So if there's something that um, you're interested in having to bring back to your shop, um, run up here really fast when I'm done and grab it. Um, I want to just, just take a brief second to talk about starting a tradition. So um, a lot of people say, oh, we don't have any traditions, or the traditions we have are really unsafe and really unhealthy, and we don't want to support them moving forward. It only takes two years to start a tradition. So this was the first time, with the class of 2014, it was the first time I tried this. And you'll see that the numbers are sparse. They're kind of um, closer together. That was the next year. I could take the photo from a vantage point in the stadium. Now I need a drone. So it just gives you a sense that it only takes two years to start a tradition. One of the things that I did when I was starting this program is I ran some uh, student focus groups to get some feedback on what kind of swag they wanted. And believe it or not, t-shirts and pennants were the two things that came up on the list. And what they said was, we want t-shirts and pennants that have our class year on it. So for those of you who come from an institution where class year is important, I know not every institution um, inspires that kind of class unity, but we now put the class year on the pennant. It looks different for every year. Um, and this is a very inexpensive piece. This is about 75 cents because it's not real felt. <laughs> so um, that's the, the focus groups were really eye-opening for me because I'm thinking they're going to say, like, we want um, earbuds or, you know, they wanted t-shirts and if anything, that had their class year on it, because that's the kind of thing that we do not sell in our bookstore. Uh, another NSO program we do is called Quizzo. It's basically a trivia game. You play in teams. There's 10 questions. And all of our questions, you might not be able to see these, but you'll get a copy of it. Actually, you can see it pretty well. All of our questions are designed to educate. And many of them don't know how much we raised. In the, it's so funny when I ask that question about how much money did we raise in the Making History campaign. They're like, $25 million. I'm like, Pfft. We made that before 8.30 on Monday morning. Uh, when they see that number, and then I always, when I'm the quizzo master, when I give the answers, I kind of talk about it, so I elaborate. I'm like, it was this much money, but this is how much went to financial aid. And so this is just an example of the quizzo questions. This is very easy to do, and we get a lot of participation in this. Not only do I do it at New Student Orientation, but I do it for Greek Week. I do it anytime any student club. I did it for the band a couple weeks ago. And really good way to get your messaging out. Another thing we do, and this is for all students, is we bring our trustees, that's our highest level of volunteer, the board of trustees, into the residence halls, and we make it seem like it's really like the other side of, ben, of Penn. What's behind the curtain? You can ask the trustees anything you want. Um, there were a lot of myths going uh, around campus by students about who the trustees were, were they paid, were they not paid, why do we make our checks out to the trustees of the University of Pennsylvania? And this gives students the chance to sit down and talk with them and have a meal with them and really get a sense of what the trustees do. Been really, 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 in fact, I have trustees saying, how come you don't never ask me? You know, I can't tell them it's because they're boring. <laughs> but you know you have those trustees who are really good with students and I, I try to go to them a lot, but they all want to do it now. Um, this is what our student volunteer um, structure looks like. So Penn Traditions is a recognized student group on campus. It took us about three years to get that recognition. Um, our Penn Tradition students have two seats on our Penn Alumni Board of Directors, and this is what the volunteer opportunities look like. And you can see the only time we are actively soliciting is for seniors for the Penn Fund. So we are not soliciting first, second, third year students. We kind of educate, build awareness, and build up to that solicitation. The Seniors for the Penn Fund is entirely student driven. There are, uh, this year I think we're up to like 47 volunteers who are actively soliciting their student groups. We have a group 
called Class Ambassadors that work with um, alumni reunion classes in May. Um, I want to point out one of these committees that's called the Penn Traditions Alumni Engagement Fund. Um, this is very unique and it was a brainchild of one of my staff members. And basically we, we pull out part of the Penn Traditions budget and we have a student board who accepts applications for funding for student groups to do events with their alumni. And the only thing we require of them is obviously receipts, um, we want the data of who attended, and we want them to give us photographs. And this has been incredible. It's become very competitive. Uh, we go through the money every year, but we've had some students who've stayed on the board for a couple of years, so they're really careful about making sure that we fund a variety of different groups. So we spend a lot of time at the beginning of a student's career, NSO, first year students, and at the end. Um, so about seven years ago, we started a transition event that we call the Final Toast. And toast is uh, one of the traditions. The students throw toast um, onto the field at a football game. And there's a lot of references to toast in our culture. So we call our event the Final Toast. And it is the one time we give our whole entire senior class alcohol at an event. And this was very controversial in the beginning. It's very monitored. We have wristbands. We fence them in. You can literally see we fence them in. Um, we give them mugs, and they make a toast. It has been very controlled. You know, this is one of the things. There have been several times in my career where this has happened. When I wanted to let freshmen into the online community, I had so many people say, no way. They're, the, you know, they're not going to be able to act appropriately. Um, we're not going to let them in. And I finally got permission to let them in. And I, I, I can't think of a single time that a student was inappropriate. Um, on the online community. I can think of dozens of times when alumni were inappropriate on the online community. And again, with this event, um, the class board, the, the student governance structure that manages the activities for the senior class, actually the student government is very, very important to me and this program, and we have great relationships with them. Um, they really help us manage the class and messaging and expectations, and um, the students have been just wonderfully wonderfully behaved and just have a great time. They're having a good time and I love it. I told you it was fun. Um, the other thing we do, we do something called new alumni orientation and you see there's a little card there. They get a little card that has their picture 2017 and they have to take this card around and get it stamped and we call it like the triple threat. This one has actually four things but attend Penn events, make an annual gift, join the alumni interview program and update your information on QuakerNet. Um, it's become um, part of senior week, so the students think everybody goes through this. We've only been doing this for about four years. And then the last senior week event before commencement, so this is Friday night. It's alumni weekend, so alumni are there. We have this Taste of Penn Spectrum at Franklin Fest for the class of 2017. They pay for it. We start to introduce our young alumni brand, which is why, a little why, Penn alumni. You see that logo there, Why Penn alumni. We start to introduce that during the end of senior year so that there's this logical transition. So what we found was we were doing a really good job with our student program, but then we were losing our recent graduates. And we realized we needed to continue that intentionality and that deliberateness. So we now have a brand for, for our young alumni program, and I'll talk a little bit about that. This is just a screenshot of what our um, online community looks like. It was built by, um, Cecily mentioned the Wharton School. This was Wharton Connect. Do you know we bought it? So Wharton Connect was the Wharton Schools. And Wharton is a part of the University of Pennsylvania. Um, it's, a lot of people get confused. It's actually the business school of the University of Pennsylvania. Um, we now have it, uh, that platform for all of our alumni. And we do welcome first year students. They are given um, access to this community after one semester at the university. And I just want to highlight um, Graduate. And Chris is getting us closer to really thinking about <laughs> purchasing Graduate for some of our needs. But I can't say enough about the power of access to a network. When we tell our um, first year students that they have access to the alumni community, you know, they, they start to think, wow, like they think it's a privilege. And, and, and it is a privilege, but uh, there's no reason why we shouldn't get them in the habit of using this. This is a very busy slide, but it just shows the transition from applying to Penn, so the interview and some of the things I mentioned, um, up to the 10th reunion. We consider um, basically prospective student through the 10th reunion, like the cohort that we're going to focus a lot of our time on. 
Um, you know, we do fine with our 25th and 50th reunion, but this cohort has been incredibly important to us because we think if we have them through their 10th reunion in a meaningful way, if they have a really high engagement score, then we have them for life. They may have some uh, ebbs and flows in their level of engagement with family and job and things like that, but if we can really get them to buy in through their 10th reunion. So I want to show you how the YPEN volunteer opportunities kind of reflect the Penn Traditions group. So we have uh, a giving component, we have regional activity, we have young alumni reps on our board. So the students who were involved as Penn Traditions leaders often stay on as YPEN leaders. And then we get many more YPEN leaders who have more time after they've graduated. We talk a lot about career resources and career services, and that has become uh, an, a focus for us. Um, here are some program examples. We use the webinar and online platform as much as we can. Um, we do a series called um, Live Career Tools, and this is an example of one that was specifically targeted to young alumni. Bing is himself a young alum, and he's very well known as, among his peers. So this was targeted to that group. This is actually happening tomorrow. This is um, networking effectively at an in-person event. We can't just assume that people know how to network. I mean, even people who are grown-ups like us get really freaked out when you say, we're going to go network. Um, so we're doing an online a webinar around this topic, and we're following this on December 18th and 19th, September 18th and 19th, with two live events, one in San Francisco and one in uh, Los Angeles, where we have mid mid-career to upper career level alumni with recent grads, and it's a networking event. We cap it at about 40 people, and again, when we talk about scale, we have 300,000 living alumni, so um, we're, we know we're reaching a small segment, but the people who come to this need it, and they want it. So that's another thing that we're doing. We have um, an online book club. So there's a, a group called PBC Guru, um, and it's very inexpensive, they run this for us. Basically, we just have to recruit the young alumni to be um, members of this book club. But you'll see the books that they're all around career. And we've had incredible, like 1,800 people for, for each book or more. And again, this is open to all alumni, but it's really resonated with our young alumni. We make sure that we have uh, our faculty available. And again, this is all via our webinar platform. So a lot of our alumni will say, you know, I was in the engineering school, so I didn't get to take any humanities classes, and I missed out on Herman Beaver's class. So we make Herman Beaver's available to them via our online platform. How many of you are using Coursera, edX, or any of those other platforms? Are any schools on those platforms? How many of you have online content of some sort? Not everybody. Here's something that you can think about doing. We have repurposed our online content through Coursera and edX for exclusive alumni-only events. We cap it at 500. They pay a, a slight charge, but we give them, um, in this case, for History of the Slave South, we gave them a jump drive with all the historical documents on it. Um, for one of the courses that I'm going to show you in a second, we gave them the book. This has been incredibly popular. It sells out in like a day. Because the difference is, you could go and take this for free online, but you're taking it with 150,000 other people. Our instance, it's only Penn alumni, so everybody has a degree, and um, there's more interaction with the TAs and the teachers. So the first one we did was History of the Slave South. That sold out. Then we did a philosophy one called Revolutionary Ideas. Um, again, it sold out. And I think our most popular one was this, the, the short history of Hollywood. Um, showed movie clips and things like that. Um, so think about any online content that you could repurpose. We just launched something called Key Quakers, which are, is our social media ambassador program. And uh, this program, is anybody using Bamboo? Anybody doing this? I know Cornell is. So this is really easy. Bamboo uh, is the platform. We populate it with stories and pictures, and people just go on, grab what they want, and shave it, save, it via, save it and share it via Instagram. Facebook, and LinkedIn. We also offer quite a bit of targeted programming for alumni of color and LGBTQ alumni. We have a multicultural outreach team which really skews young. Um, well, not our team skews young, although they're young too, but the people who are participating in these groups are, are, are pretty young. 
And here's some examples of some of the specific programming we've done for recent grads, just to give you kind of a flavor of how they're branded. That's our arts and wine brand. We have something we call a highball. And I just love this graphic. And I love that it was 11, 11, 11, because that's not going to happen again for 100 years. So I have to use this for another 94 years. Um, another thing I want to point out, all alumni events, there is an opportunity here. OK, so this is the same event that all alumni, whether you went to the medical school, the business school, or the undergrad college, everybody's getting invited to this. But we have different marketing for our young alumni. And you'll see that the language reflects um, the fact that it's going to young alumni. The pictures reflect that. We have seen um, a significant uptick in our young alumni participation in all university events when we went this strategy. Another thing that we're doing is we're complementing all university events with something fun. This one we call the afterglow. So after the event is over and all the old alumni leave, we dim the lights, throw up a Y Pen logo on the wall, and make it um, the afterglow. And this, again, um, this was a university campaign event. And that's not the kind of thing that we generally were getting young alumni to come to. So having this model has really increased our attendance. I talked about that uh, triple threat. And I have some examples up here. Whenever we're doing anything for our young alumni, we have, um, hmm. oh, here they are. So three things all great alumni do, and it has that triple threat. And one of the things that the Y Pen program, actually, and the Pen Traditions program, both of those programs are true partnerships. And I'm not just saying partnerships on paper, but true partnerships between alumni relations and the annual fund. So there are staff members on both of those teams who work very closely on these programs. OK, so let's do a quick recap. You might not be able to make a sign and stick it on campus and have your president call you, but if you can make your case dramatically, make it. Make sure it's fun. Start early. Build that foundation. You have students on campus for two, three, four, five years, and they're alumni forever. Make sure you develop messages. Think about what you can do to engage prospective students using alumni interviews or hosting them on campus. New student orientation is a huge opportunity. Think about events where the students live and volunteer opportunities. Think about that transition. You guys know all this. I'm going to move it along. Creative programming that's not just social, but networking and academic and intellectual. And this is something I say all the time. In fact, now I have like my whole office saying it. Be intentional, explicit, and deliberate. So we're not trying to hide our messaging. And we're not trying to trick people. Like one of the things that um, our senior gift drive was known for before I took it over, they used to take students' housing deposits as a gift for the senior gift drive. So, who makes the housing deposit when a student is a freshman? Probably like their parent or guardian. It's not coming out of their pocket, but it was like $250. So our office, before I was there, they would say, will you just sign over your housing deposit to the Penn Fund? That'll be your senior gift. And students were like, all right. And then we'd go back to them the next year and say, thank you so much for your $250 gift last year. We hope you'll match that gift. And young alumni were furious. They're like, I don't even know what you're talking about. Then the parents are saying, wait, where's my housing deposit? So that kind of gimmicky stuff doesn't work. <laughs> so that's, that's one of the things that didn't work. Um, anything where you can't deliver a message. So if you're going to do something, think about why you're doing it and how you can get your messaging out. Um, don't limit the number of students on committees. We have huge committees when we need them. Um, let them use social media. I mean, I think if there's things that, that people post that aren't um, cool with you. That's going to happen. We can't control everything. Um, make sure that you're outlining specific um, volunteer opportunities and be explicit and hold them accountable. Give students access to your alumni online community. All these giveaways that I'm giving away to you, um, 
I'm going to point out a couple things that are unique. So this is something that I work with a um, undergraduate student design class. So these are students who are designing. Bye. I miss you. <laughs> um, they're called Penn Traditions Fat Cars. I went in and said to them, will you make me a poster for the Penn Traditions program? I have this really great idea. I want a poster. I'm like, you can go out and you can make it square, but I want a poster. They came back with this idea. So it's 35 cards that have photographs, illustrations, and facts about everything from convocation to commencement to famous alumni, alumni weekend, homecoming, alumni giving. We give these out at New Student Orientation. I'll leave these here if you want to take a look. Uh, there's also like little simple things that everybody needs. Lint roller, lip gloss, breath mints, the little thing, I don't know what it's called, that you put on the back of your cell phone. So we try to brand everything and give little things away. And believe me, this stuff, what I found is as I've gotten older in this program, um, I lost my clicker, I don't have to spend as much money on food. So I used to have to kind of uh, bribe people and incentivize them with food. So that has changed. I, they're coming to the program, so I like them to have this kind of thing. I've traded out my food budget for my swag budget. Um, I talked about programming in the student residences. You could do that, that quizzo game in residences. You could bring your, your highest level volunteers into the residences. Um, peer to peer solicitation. So, for those of you who are responsible for um, a giving component, what I found is peers, I mean, we all know this, but even at the student level, peer to peer solicitation, what we try to do is incentivize student groups to get 100% senior participation. So, if you're in um, jazz band, you get all the seniors in your jazz band, um, or on the football team, or uh, on, in an a cappella group. Think about things that have big impact. I didn't show a picture of it, but um, most of our institutions are planting trees at some time of the year. Um, and you could probably talk them into planting one tree a year that becomes the class tree. So they're going to plant it anyway. And you make it the class of 2021 tree. We do that at homecoming. So the class of 2021 will have their tree planted at homecoming. Um, and any time students and alumni can interact. Um, so these really, really are my final thoughts. I know I've been giving you final thoughts for a few minutes, but these are my final, final thoughts. So focus on participation, um, attendees, donors, and volunteers. Collaboration is so important. I could give you 100 examples of collaborations that we've done. And that was hard work in the beginning, but now we've gotten to the point where people want to collaborate with us. Brand the program. We spent a lot of time coming up with um, the name of the program, the logo. Um, building your foundation is critical, and you will see a shift in culture. And it only takes two years to, make, to start a tradition. I'd love to see all of you do, whether it's um, something that says class of 2021 or if it's like acupuncture, acupuncture program. I'd love to see acupuncture on a big field somewhere in Manhattan. Will you send me that picture? Sure. All right. Um, everybody in this room needs to be an active advocate. Talk about it get people engaged, get support, get resources, and it will transform the experience over time. It's about relationships, and make sure it's fun. It's got to be fun, because the students are going to want to come when they hear, oh, the Penn Traditions Program, they give away all that stuff, and it's really fun. We sing songs. So that's what I have for you. Want me to play the Rocky theme again? <laughs> Questions? Can we bring up the house lights? Suzanne Wagstaff, uh, Washington Hi, University in St. Louis. Um, was the Penn Traditions program in place of or separate from like an orientation week or? So orientation existed, but they didn't have any of the program that I just, programs that I just described. It was more about safety and academic uh, integrity and um, go meet your college house. They didn't do, that was, that's, I'm glad you brought this up because what I did when I did a gap analysis and I sat down with students and I said, what do they tell you when you get your admission, admission materials? What do they tell you when you're coming to school? Let me see the, the new student orientation calendar. And all this stuff was missing, that, that we, there was no place to learn the history and traditions. They, they didn't know the songs. Um, you know, they didn't know what alumni were. So new student orientation existed. We just inserted all of this programming. And it took some time. Yes, it's a part of it. So what we, like that program, High Volta Haiti, The Pen Experience, that's like 
Wednesday night and Thursday morning they have they meet with their academic advisors. It's all it's all the same thing. So the students don't know any difference. So they think this is just as important as academic integrity and safety in Philadelphia. But it took some, it took, it was, I'm, I'm acting like I just stepped in and was like, all right, here we are, new student orientation. I had to fight tooth and nail to get into it. it it's so packed. They had to move some things around and yeah, it wasn't easy. So my question actually piggybacks on that. How did you win over the student affairs staff who sometimes are alumni relations professionals' biggest headache because they want it to be Groundhog Day. What they did last year, they do this year. It's the same schedule over and over and breaking through that we've always done it this way. It, that, that was, student affairs was tough. I started meeting with them. I started to get to know them. You know what I did? I got on the leadership weekend uh, team where we take like 50 kids in the woods and bond over mafia. And, um, but I, I was relentless. I mean, I really was. I, to give you one example, um, there was somebody in student affairs who said, absolutely not. My students are too busy, they're too stressed. He worked with nursing students. He said, I'm not, I'm not gonna introduce anything else. Like, I don't care about giving, I don't care about any of this. And it happened to be at a time when we were getting very low raises at the institution, and he had two young children. I said, listen, Adam, um, this, is, this is our future. If we can get this group of, of students engaged as alumni to become leaders, you know, every, it's just going to be a better place for all of us. And we'll start to get, like, higher raises. And he was like, do you think so? And I was like, oh, definitely. <laughs> and that's what it took. I, try, I did whatever it took. I would bring, I would like, you guys, I'll bring you T-shirts. I'll come to your events. And um, I, 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 it was on one of my slides. I should have mentioned it. I started something called the Staff Networking Group. That's what it was called. Very simple. And basically, it was staff who worked with students across not administrators, not faculty, but staff who worked in fraternity and sorority affairs, all of our um, uh, cultural resource centers, um, people who work in athletics. We have people from the religious organizations. And we get together once a month on a Friday from 10 to 12. And whoever hosts the meeting gets to drive the agenda. So I hosted a meeting. I was like, OK, you guys, we're going to have so much fun with this. It's called the Penn Traditions Program. And we're all going to be a part of it. And just like, I, just over and over. But it, it, wasn't, it wasn't easy. And then the, the, one of the greatest things was, the director of that office left, and I swooped in when the new person came in. I was like, oh, so we work together. Like, we're really close. <laughs> Penn Traditions program. I work with all the class presidents. She's like, great. Oh my god, this is great. So literally, I did whatever it took. <laughs> but that's, I'm lucky, because I've been there so long. So I think turnover is a problem with these kinds of programs, because it takes like somebody who can just keep like pushing. and. Then it just, you know, new people come in and they're like, oh yeah, that's the Penn Traditions Program. We have to be a part of that. So just hang in there. Other questions? Yeah. What do you do when they age out? Tenth reunion? Yeah. So um, we have a comprehensive alumni relations program. So um, we have part of our classes and reunions team who works with um, those kind of in-between years. Um, but everything else that we do, we have a family program, so for those alumni who have uh, children, there are things they can do with their children. But we kind of funnel them into everything else, and by that time we have established leaders. I mean, I'm starting to see some of our young alumni leaders like going onto boards of overseers. So they just are invited to and participate in everything else that we do. From the student relations timeline you showed, I, I really, I've done the final Oh, the first toast is when they're seniors. It's called uh, Feb Club, so it's in February. So um, it's a unique pen tradition. In February, the senior class does an event every single day for 28 days. And they, they need help with programming. So they're like, can you help us with something during one of those days? So it, that's, that's the first toast in February. And then the final toast is in January, or May, in May. I saw them. One more? Yes, so one of the best investments I ever made. So we were uh, working with um, outside vendors for many, many years. And I restructured our communications team. And what I found was we had a couple people who were really good writers, but we really weren't writing. Um, we have a, a central development writing team that does that. So I, I took the resources and I restructured and I hired a designer. and. It, it, he, I'm not paying him a lot of money. In fact, I feel, I feel terrible. He should be making a lot more money because he does all of this. 
He's unbelievable. In fact, I'm, I'm going to show you this. This guy is so creative. Um, this is our homecoming. This is what we give out for homecoming. So it's your basic, like, here's what we do Saturday. Here's what we do Sunday. But look at this. Are you ready? Sorry. So we have a love statue on our campus, and he came up with this. I nearly fell over. I thought he was going to put, like, a picture of a football. And so this is, you know, all the words, locust walk. Can I have that? Yeah. <laughs> I have a bunch of them. Is that so cool? But yes, I, I, honestly, if, if you are planning to do this kind of program, I'm, I, I pay him very little. He's like an assistant director level, but he was, he's an artist, and he's like, you know what? I can't get a job doing this and being creative, and you give me a lot of uh, flexibility to be creative. So, um, yeah, that's, it was worth it. It was worth it. I hope I can keep them. Okay. Uh, I think the amazing thing about Elise the generosity of her approach. I think she wants you to be successful. She wants you to copy and paste what she's done. She, every time I hear her speech, she makes it even better. All you need to do is copy and paste. She's giving you the materials. We're going to get all of this presentation to all of you. You can all emulate what she's done. And I want you to give her an incredible round of applause. Thank you. You're coming to Australia. Thank you all. Amazing.